February 21st, 2023 meeting of the Transportation and Seattle Public Utilities Committee will come to order. The time is 9.31 a.m. I'm Alex Peterson, chair of the committee. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Herbold? Here. Councilmember Morales? Here. Councilmember Strauss? Present. Chair Peterson? Present. For present. Thank you. And Councilmember Sawan is excused. If there's no objection, today's proposed agenda will be adopted. Hearing no objection, the agenda is adopted. Chair's report. Good morning again. Welcome to the February 21st meeting of our committee, Transportation Seattle Public Utilities. Uh, our agenda today has just two items. First on the agenda is Resolution 32082, which would approve an update to the city's solid waste plan. Uh, the plan is a lengthy document, so it is in committee today just for a briefing and discussion so that committee members will have more time to review it. Uh, we'll bring it back to our committee for a vote on the resolution on March 7. Next on our agenda is an update on outreach and work uh, our Seattle Department of Transportation has been doing during its phase two of crafting the Seattle Transportation Plan. We heard an update from this team back in September on phase one. I know we're all eager to have a public briefing and discussion on uh, the Seattle Department of Transportation's action plan and review to save lives and reduce injuries by improving its Vision Zero traffic safety program. We had made room for SDOT at our committee two weeks ago and today, but the executive asked to come to our March 7th meeting. So we'll make room for them March 7th. We'll give them plenty of time so we can discuss that. Fortunately, the executive uh, plans to announce their proposed improvements soon within the next week or so, and hopefully a high level preview at today's uh, State of the City address. And rather than just pointing out problems that need fixing, the Herald administration wanted to add solutions and details of how they will leverage the new $25 million federal grant they received earlier this month. Um, we are keeping our meeting relatively brief today because I know many will want to attend the mayor's State of the City address at noon today at uh, Fisher Pavilion in Seattle Center, which can also be viewed online at the award-winning Seattle Channel. So we'll go ahead and um, go to the public comment section of the agenda. Uh, at this time, we'll open the general public comment period for the Transportation and Seattle Public Utilities Committee. As usual for our hybrid meeting, we have people signed up to give public comment both online and in person. And I'm seeing that online, um, we have about 14 speakers online, but, but about half of them are actually signed up to discuss an item for two o'clock today at the full city council meeting. It looks like they're here to speak to um, Councilmember Sawan's proposed ordinance on caste discrimination. So that uh, is at two o'clock today. It's not for the transportation committee, which is happening now. As we know from section 11 C3, council committees accept public comment on items uh, relating to their committee only. So uh, if you have signed up for to speak on uh, an ordinance that's gonna actually be at our full council meeting today, instead, you wanna re-sign up at noon today online or come in here to sign up uh, in person after, after 12 noon. Um, so I will be calling on those who are here to speak about transportation and Seattle Public Utilities. Okay, I'll go ahead and read the instructions. Uh, public comment period is up to 20 minutes. Each speaker will get two minutes to speak. I'll call on two speakers at a time and in the order in which registered on the council's website or on the sign-in sheet in the council chambers at City Hall. If you've not yet registered to speak but would like to, you can sign up before the end of this public comment period by going to the council's website at seattle.gov forward slash council or by using the sign-in sheet near the public comment microphone toward the front of this council chamber here at City Hall. For remote speakers, once I call a speaker's name, staff will unmute the appropriate microphone and an automatic prompt of you have been unmuted will be the speaker's cue that it is their turn to speak and the speaker must then press star six to begin speaking. Press star six when it's your turn. For all public commenters, please begin speaking by stating your name and the item you are addressing. As a reminder, public comment should relate to an item on today's committee agenda. 
or to our committee's oversight responsibilities. Speakers will hear a chime when 10 seconds are left of the allotted time. Once you hear that chime, we ask that you begin to wrap up your public comment. If speakers do not end their public comment, at the, uh, at the end of the allotted time, the speaker's microphone will be muted to allow us to call on the next speaker. If you're providing public comment remotely, once you have completed your comment, we ask that you please disconnect from the line. Uh, and if you plan to continue following this meeting, please do so via Seattle channel or the listening options listed on the agenda. Uh, the regular public comment for period for this meeting is open. We'll begin with the first speaker on the list. Um, are you ready here in, in the chambers? Come on up and pull that microphone really close to your, really close to your self there. Uh, Patricia Harris, good morning. Good morning. I'm Pat Harris and I live here in downtown Seattle. And I'm here to speak on the issue of the signs on the garbage trucks. You know those signs. Um, breathe clean Seattle powered by renewable natural gas. First, I want to say that the suggestion that Seattle residents are breathing clean around waste management, uh, methane gas powered vehicles isn't accurate. And Seattle residents shouldn't be encouraged to breathe near them. Methane gas powered trucks still produce significant levels of air pollution that are linked to illnesses. And breathing near the trucks is not breathing clean, as they say. A second point is that evidence is needed that the trucks are in fact running on renewable natural gas, better known sometimes as biogas, and not on conventional methane gas that mostly comes through our pipelines or other methods for fracting. Renewable natural gas is the gas industry's new favorite marketing scheme, a way to look like they're selling a cleaner product than methane gas from fracking. Um, a group called Data Leaks uncovered some information and it suggests that it's highly unlikely the trucks are running on anything other than conventional methane gas or conventional gas with a very small percentage of biogas. By allowing the ads, Seattle is providing what amounts to free publicity for the concept of renewable natural gas, which is oil and gas industries um, are actively using to cover using gases that are in fact. Thank you very much. Next, we'll go to our online speakers. First up, we've got Megan Cruz, followed, followed by Caleb Haringa. Go ahead, Megan. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes. I'm Megan Cruz. Thank you. I'm Megan Cruz, commenting today on the Seattle Transportation Plan. SDOT's doing a great job elevating the issues related to the movement of people, but there's still little public-facing information about the movement of goods in this plan and it's the impact of urban freight on Seattleites. The issues go beyond traffic impacts to environmental and public safety, as well as equity. Compared to cars, trucks account for three times the vehicle miles traveled on city streets and 80% of transportation-related emissions. Among U.S. cities, Seattle ranks 11th in excess CO2 from trucks and 15th in both annual truck delays and congestion costs. It ranks among the 52 cities cited for its wide discrepancy in exposure to pollution from freight traffic in BIPOC communities compared to affluent white neighborhoods. We know we have a problem because since 2018, the city has collected data and attempted to institute policies and codes to mitigate freight impacts but each time it backs off when met by resistance. Just last December, the council declined to adopt a comp plan amendment recommended by the Seattle Planning Commission that simply requires the city to create an urban strategy for freight. It's time to elevate public awareness of this problem and start hosting public forums. SDOT needs the support of this committee and the rest of the council to do this. We have the information we need about this issue. 
Now we just need the political will to do the right thing. Please help. Thanks. Thank you. Next, we've got Caleb Haringa, followed by Clara Cantor. Go ahead, Caleb. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Thanks. My name is Caleb Haringa, and I'm a Seattle resident and the campaign director of Gas Leaks, a campaign aimed at educating the public about the risks of so-called natural gas. Waste management provides garbage service in the northwest and south ends of Seattle, and it's required under the terms of their contract with the city to power their trucks with 100% renewable natural gas. Also known as biogas, renewable natural gas is methane captured from landfills, sewage treatment plants, and large dairies. Waste management touts its use of biogas on the sides of its trucks, which all read, Breathe Clean Seattle, powered by renewable natural gas. But analysis of data raises some serious questions about whether the trucks are actually using biogas or running on conventional methane gas, which primarily comes from fracking in Canada. Waste management sustainability report shows that they do not capture any methane at their nearby landfills. And state records show that the majority of biogas projects in the state are already dedicated to other uses than power and garbage trucks. Gas leaks, uh, the Sierra Club, 350 Seattle, and Breach Collective are asking the city of Seattle and the Washington State Attorney General's office to demand that waste management account for where it is sourcing its biogas. The company's ads on the sides of their trucks clearly lead a person to believe that its trucks are running on biogas. And if that's not true, then the ads are misleading and the city should not allow them. Um, oil and gas industry giants like Chevron are heavily advertising their use of trivial amounts of biogas in order to appear like they're cleaning up the product that they sell. But this provides cover for the continued build out of the methane gas pipeline system, which risks putting our climate goals out of reach. Seattle shouldn't be letting its garbage trucks provide free advertising for false climate solutions like biogas, especially if the trucks aren't actually using it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we've got Clara Cantor, followed by Jess Wallach. Go ahead, Clara. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, this is Clara Cantor. I'm a community organizer with Seattle Neighborhood Greenways. Um, I'm speaking today to report that there have been 13 people killed by traffic violence on our streets since the new SDOT director, Greg Spots, announced his 90-day review of Vision Zero, which is our collective goal to have zero traffic deaths or serious injuries by 2030. That number includes um, 12 of those 13 people were walking, rolling in a wheelchair, or biking. Five people were killed in District 2, which represents just one-seventh of our population. Four of those people were killed on Aurora Avenue alone, and two of those people were killed by government vehicles, one by SPD and one by a Metro bus. Those are our neighbors, our family members, our friends, and their deaths on our streets are a direct result of policy decisions that are made in City Hall to delay safety projects, to prioritize vehicle speeds over lives, and to underinvest in our neighborhoods that need it most. I'm delighted to hear that the Vision Zero review will finally be released on March 7th, and I'm excited to see what's in it. I'm here to ask this transportation committee to review it meticulously and to push SDOT to act with urgency to save lives, to restart important safety projects that have been delayed and been put on hold, like the Georgetown to South Park Trail, West Marginal Way, Beacon Avenue, and to ensure that the transportation plan that you'll hear about this morning actually prioritizes safety in action and in detail and not just as a goal on the front page and never again, and make sure that it includes concrete plans to address the most dangerous streets in our city, like Aurora Avenue, like Greenier Avenue, MLK Way, the whole of Soto, and to really treat this like the, the urgent crisis that it is. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Next, we have Jess Wallach, followed by Dylan Plummer. Go ahead, Jess. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, my name is Jess Wallach, and I'm a campaign's co-director with 350 Seattle. Um, I just want to take a second and underscore what Clara just shared. Uh, in the last week, some of my roommates who ride bicycles to get around because they don't have cars were almost hit by cars. So... Everything that Clara shared, that grief is real, that fear is real, 
and the need for this committee to take traffic violence seriously is real. Thank you, Clara, for bringing that. Um, I'm also calling in this morning about the misleading ads on the sides of Seattle garbage trucks. Um, here at 350 Seattle, we are certainly not breathing clean or easy about those ads um, with significant questions about whether they're even running on renewable natural gas or if it's gas, most of which is extracted from indigenous lands in Canada. Um, we're extremely concerned. Climate justice demands that we stop the build out of frac gas infrastructure in all its forms. And so called renewable natural gas just helps the industry appear like they're cleaning up their act while continuing to drill and frack for more gas. We believe that Seattle residents shouldn't have to be bombarded with misleading information that promotes the expansion of the frack gas and fossil fuel system every time they get their garbage picked up, especially when renewable natural gas is just as toxic as other fossil fuels to breathe. Um, whether or not these management trucks are burning renewable natural gas or conventional fracked gas, these methane gas-powered vehicles still produce huge levels of air pollution, just as bad or worse than diesel trucks in some situations. So as Seattle continues to transition from polluting fossil fuels to clean renewable electricity, we have to hold the line on corporate greenwashing and false solutions. It would be like Seattle allowing trains to come through with advertisements for clean coal. We all know that clean coal is fossil fuel industry PR to keep polluting for profit. Seattle and King County have already taken a critical step of saying no to allowing fossil fuel ads on the sides of buses. We shouldn't allow them on our garbage trucks either. Thank you very much. And next we've got Dylan Plummer, and that may be our last speaker here about transportation or utilities. Go ahead, Dylan. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to provide comment. My name is Dylan Plummer, and I'm a senior campaign representative with the Sierra Club. The Sierra Club is a national environmental nonprofit organization, and in Washington State alone, we have over 27,000 members and over 67,000 supporters working for environmental and climate justice. I'm testifying today to highlight the concerns addressed in a letter that the Sierra Club, along with other partners, submitted to the City Council regarding the company Waste Management's claims about, uh, quote, renewable natural gas or biomethane. Waste Management provides garbage service in Seattle and has its use of renewable natural gas or biogas on the side of its trucks, which all read, Breathe Clean Seattle, powered by renewable natural gas. Uh, while there are a number of falsehoods associated with Waste Management's claims, as you've already heard from my colleague, I want to focus on the fact that even if those trucks were powered by 100% renewable natural gas, which they are almost certainly not, the impacts of burning biomethane on air quality and in turn public health are identical to those of burning conventional methane. Studies have shown that methane gas powered engines can produce five to 50 times more ultra fine particles, which are linked to asthma, cancer, and Alzheimer's disease compared to diesel engines. A study of the Cal or by the California Air Resources Board found that heavy-duty gas-powered vehicles emitted asthma-causing nitrogen oxides at higher levels than they were originally certified for, and that NOx emissions tended to increase as the vehicles age, sometimes to levels higher than their diesel counterparts. This is not to mention that, according to a report by California Climate and Agricultural Network, um, a greater market for manure-based RNG will likely increase localized pollution for vulnerable rural communities by reinforcing highly polluting industrial livestock farming practices. So uh, the company's insinuation on the side of every garbage truck that rolls past residents that they can, quote, breathe clean due to the fact that these trucks are powered by biomethane, which again, they're likely not, is completely misleading. And I encourage the city council to take action on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Colleagues, that was our last public speaker here um, that was present. And so we will go ahead and move on to the first uh, legislative item on the agenda, uh, which is just a briefing and discussion. Agenda item one, will the clerk please read the short title of the first agenda item into the record. Agenda item one, resolution 32082, a resolution adopting Seattle's 2022 solid waste plan update, moving upstream to zero waste for briefing and discussion. Thank you. Yes, colleagues, this is just for briefing and discussion only today. Uh, we have Seattle Public Utilities here to tell us more about their proposed update to the solid waste plan. We also have Brian Goodnight from Council Central Staff. If committee members have any questions between now and when this resolution comes back to committee on March 7th for a vote, 
uh, central staff, I believe, will be preparing a, a memo uh, before March 7th that will analyze the proposed solid waste plan update and can include answers to any questions you might have today. Uh, Councilmember Herbold. Thank you. Um, I was just uh, taken by the uh, public comment today, and I know there was a um, um, uh, an email notification to all of us last week about uh, a new campaign around um, the signing of um, our, of our trucks, uh, perhaps in conflict with um, the contractual obligations uh, with with waste management. Um, and I'm just wondering, do, do we know if anybody um, with the SPU team here with us today will be able to answer some questions on that? It is related to solid waste, perhaps tangentially, but um, it seems like it would be really useful to have, be able to ask some questions about that. Yeah, thank you, Councilor Herbold. Yes, let's let's ask. I, I also did send an email to Seattle Public Utilities asking them to look into that matter, uh, what waste management at one of our contractors is allegedly doing on their trucks. So, um, and we can also ask today during this update, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so we do have our presenters here from Seattle Public Utilities who will be going through a PowerPoint presentation for us. Um, and if you look on the agenda, this resolution has some supporting documents, uh, but but mainly the very lengthy uh, solid waste plan update is is included as attachment A. So, um, and central staff again will be doing a memo to assist in analyzing this. Welcome, Seattle Public Utilities. Go ahead and take it away. Great, thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Jeff Fowler. I am the Deputy Director of Solid Waste. With me is Susan Fife Ferris, Director of Solid Waste Planning and Program Management, and Stephanie Schwanger, the Project Manager of the 2022 Solid Waste Plan Update. I'll be providing a high level overview of what the 2022 Solid Waste Plan Update is what's new and how Seattle is shifting focus to move upstream to prevent waste. I will then go over what the next steps are and what we are asking of you today. But first we wanna be clear why we are shifting focus upstream to prevent waste and how this relates to the city's 70% recycling goal. We did not meet the city's aspirational recycling goal to recycle 70% of municipal solid waste by 2022 for reasons we will mention later in the presentation. SPU will continue investing in recycling, but in keeping with best practice and where the solid waste industry is headed, we are going to focus on diversion and waste prevention, which can offer better benefits in the long term and is better aligned with Seattle's goal of advancing zero waste and the circular economy. We do not want people to have the impression that Seattle is moving away from recycling. We need the public to continue to recycle and compost. The shift to more holistic goals is to guide our work in the most effective and efficient manner to reduce waste overall. We're here today to brief you on the 2022 solid waste plan titled Moving Upstream to Zero Waste, the city's comprehensive management plan for solid waste so that you can consider it for a possible vote at your next meeting on March 7th. The draft 2022 plan update has already undergone preliminary review by the Department of Ecology, which provided us with complimentary feedback and found it to comply with solid waste planning requirements. We'll bring the plan update back to the committee for our, your consideration and a possible vote on March 7th, followed by consideration by the full council on March 15, 14th. You can see here we are in the adoption process. In addition to review by ecology, which occurred in step five, the 2022 plan update has undergone both SEPA and an optional public comment review in steps three and four. We worked extensively with our solid waste advisory committee to develop and review the 2022 plan update in addition to extensive public engagement. Following city council approval, the 2022 plan update will be transmitted to ecology for final approval. Let's talk about the significant aspects of the 2022 solid waste plan update. It's required by the Washington Department of Ecology and documents how we plan to manage solid waste in Seattle for the next six years with an outlook toward the next 20 years. The plan update documents existing conditions and projects, identifies actions to continue our leadership in the solid waste industry, and suggests creating new metrics and targets to help guide our work and measure success. 
Some key highlights of the 2022 plan update include incorporation of the city principles from SPU's strategic business plan, especially equity and operational resilience, aligning our work with other key policy documents, taking a more holistic life cycle approach to solid waste management to eliminate or reduce waste upstream for the greatest environmental impact, working toward development of new metrics to measure success. This graphic illustrates what we mean by having a holistic life cycle approach to materials management, from extracting raw materials to making products to end of product life. The solid waste industry has historically focused on managing materials at end of life or when we're done using them. This includes recycling and landfill disposal. Focusing on the whole life cycle, including preventing waste in the first place, allows us to find new opportunities to reduce environmental impacts, engage with community, conserve resources, and reduce costs much more than just managing materials at the end of life. So how is Seattle moving upstream? We'll continue to support recycling, composting, and diversion efforts while increasing focus on waste prevention strategies. A few of these strategies include encouraging food waste prevention, developing <coughs> and supporting rules and regulations to reduce the use of non-recyclable single-use items, building public-private partnerships around reuse, investing in community-led waste prevention work and a circular economy through our grant program, and developing a comprehensive waste prevention strategic plan. Moving upstream with an emphasis on stopping waste at the source requires we rethink traditional recycling rate goals. We've had great success with recycling, doubling the recycling rate over the past 30 years, primar primarily through incentives, programs, policy, and regulations. We plan to continue our national leadership in waste reduction, but to do this, we must target opportunities to stop waste from the start. The upstream focus keeps waste out of the cycle or decreases it, and in turn decreases the negative environmental impacts. We are currently at approximately 53% recycling rate with a peak rate of 59% in 2016, which is significantly higher than the US average. There are many good reasons to expand beyond the recycling rate and develop goals better aligned with upstream work. There were 110 recommendations in the 2011 solid waste plan that if implemented, we believe Seattle could achieve 70% recycling. However, not all of these recommendations turned out to be feasible or cost-effective. Changes to material types and designs used in packaging have dramatically altered the composition and volumes in the waste stream. Clear examples are elimination of phone books and the reduction of newspapers. The recycling goal doesn't measure or communicate the importance of waste prevention, nor does it account for the benefits of preventing or reducing certain specific types of waste like food. It is, it is isn't even the best measure of the city's recycling and composting programs, which could be better measured through capture rates. In addition, the industry is moving away from a recycling rate. The Department of Ecology stopped using the recycling rate as its key metric in their planning efforts in 2016. Seattle is doing a great job of reducing waste generation and landfill disposal, with both, with both on a downward trend over the past 20 plus years. Before the pandemic, we achieved the lowest residential waste generation in our history of 2.1 pounds per person per day in 2019. And thank you. We have a comment or question from Councilmember Herbold. Thank you. I'm um, just putting putting the uh, aspirational goal of 70% aside. I'm I'm not asking why we did not um, meet that goal, but I am interested to know why we lost apparently um, ground since 2016. Um, and, and maybe that is, uh, as you mentioned, because um, there are things that aren't in the waste stream anymore um, that affect the percentages, but just wondering if you could just get a little bit uh, more granular in in the why we've, we've dropped from 58.8% in uh, 2016 to about 52% in 2021. Susan, can I ask you to answer that one? Yeah, hi, thank you, Council Member Herbal. I appreciate the question and um, 
it's a natural one given the slide there. Um, so the honest answer is we don't know exactly. We don't have the, the specific data to tell us why. Um, but what we believe has to do with it is the composition of the materials has changed significantly over the last decade, um, increasing materials that are not recyclable um, versus, and decreasing the materials that are easily recyclable. So examples of that is um, the mixed materials packaging, um, like your flexible packaging. Think about the, the dog food bag or the cat food bag or the cereal bag that you get today used to come in a cardboard box that was um, easily recyclable, if not, that material is not recyclable. Um, also easily recyclable materials that used to be commonplace, you know, even a decade ago was your newspaper, um, your daily paper, your phone books, those types of things, all very heavy material. Um, they um, have decreased in the waste stream significantly. So the, the change in the waste stream itself has, um, we think, impacted. Another thing just specific to Seattle is the fact that um, the North Transfer Station opened in 2016, at the end of 2016, really went live in 2017. And so um, material that was going north to um, garbage that was going north to the King County system was brought back into the Seattle system, which we believe impacted us. And then also you've seen the um, the boom in, in construction. And we also think the boom in construction has impacted because we have more material that is um, truly um, construction and demolition debris that's flowing through our transfer stations, but um, is being captured as municipal solid waste. And those are different waste streams. So we think that heavy material has also impacted. Um, but still, we still have a very high recycling rate, um, especially when you compare us to um, anywhere else in the in the country. So um, I hope that helps you understand a little bit. But again, I go back to we don't specifically know um, all the all the reasons. Appreciate that. Thank you. Councilmember Morales. Thank you, Chair Peterson. Um, thanks very much for this presentation. Um, a, a couple of slides ago, uh, there was a lot of pictures about the food stream. And I know that we have been able to significantly decrease our food related waste. Um, but when you're talking about, I think effectively what you're talking about is decreasing consumption uh, of things that we are not going to use and then end up just throwing away. So much of our, um, well, our food packaging, certainly it, some of it is still a lot of plastic, uh, but there's a lot of other, I mean, it's hard to buy anything that isn't packaged in plastic. And so I'm wondering, um, uh, you've talked a little bit about that issue. It sounds like Susan that there's ma materials are different. Some things are harder to recycle. Um, <clears throat> I'm interested in uh, the role we may be able to play in uh, changing requirements for how things get packaged. I know that's a much bigger market issue. I'm also interested in the question of whether there is a market for recycled goods because I feel like in the last few years we've heard that um, the market is decreasing and you know what we are able to do with our recycled material uh, the window is shutting on what we're able to do with that so can you talk about those issues a little bit please Jeff do you want me to take that yeah that's fine I, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. thank you yeah. um, um thank you council member Morales um so I'll take two part question first part um, what can we do to change the packaging? So we're actively engaged in a number of efforts. Um, Seattle is on the forefront. Sometimes I say we're leading from behind, but often we're in the forefront. Um, we work at a national level with the US Plastics Pack, which is a national group that evolved out of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation um, and is one of many PACs around the world that is working upstream with um, package producers to help um, eliminate materials um, from packaging that can't be recyclable, trying to standardize packaging so it's more easily captured. That's what we mean by capture rate, um, being able to actually capture the material for recycling. And um, so we're actively engaged in that. Then at the state level, we're also actively engaged in the producer responsibility bill that's being, um, it's known as the RAP Act. And um, I believe Councilmember Herbold might have spoken on behalf of that. 
And um, we're, we've been working on that for about three years now with our um, partners around the state, um, both um, municipalities, jurisdictions, and then um, private industry to try to craft a bill that will work for all. Um, that's another um, aspect of trying to get producers to take responsibility for what they're putting into the waste stream and, and making them um, take the financial um, responsibility for ensuring that it's recycled. So we're very actively engaged in that. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. I know um, I'm very involved. Um, I'm on the board for the U.S. Plastics PAC. And um, I know that it, we have a 2025 goal um, of eliminating unnecessary um, types of plastic, but we're also looking at how can we um, get people to ensure that things are being able to be manufactured in a way we can capture. Um, that said, the second part of your question is, are things actually being recycled? And I can guarantee that they are actually being recycled. We have, um, we work with our recycler, um, Republic Services, closely to ensure that the material that is coming through there, and we have a very low residual rate, which is the actual garbage going out the back door, it's around 10%. The actual 90% that's being, um, you know, sorted and bundled and sold as a commodity are actually being sold into markets where it's being used to remake into new products. So, um, we track that and we work closely um, to that under our contract. So um, we can give you more details, but um, yes, it's being recycled. Um, do not believe all the rumors you hear out there. Thank you. Uh, please continue with the sure. presentation. Will do. Thank you for those questions. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So we've already made progress in developing some key metrics that will more accurately reflect the industry focus on moving upstream to prevent waste. For example, we've updated the residential per capita waste generation and disposal targets. We have developed a consumption-based greenhouse gas inventory of solid waste emissions with our regional partners. We have teams working on new targets around waste generation and landfill disposal, metrics that could help us better understand the materials in the waste stream and food waste prevention. We're developing a waste prevention strategic plan, which includes working to develop other measures of success, such as environmental, social, and economic impacts of avoided waste, cost savings and job creation through waste prevention and other potential metrics. Here are some examples of metrics and targets we're thinking about. Reductions in landfill tons, which addresses diversion as well as prevention, a ceiling on generated tons, and daily waste generation per household or business or employee. We have a project team digging into the data to establish which of the tonnage-based metrics and targets to move forward with, and the waste prevention strategic plan effort will investigate measuring environmental, economic, and equity impacts. To summarize, the, these are the main takeaways about the 2022 solid waste plan update. Seattle continues to be a leader, aligning with the upstream movement in the solid waste industry to prevent waste at the source. We're rethinking metrics and targets to align with preventing and reducing waste. We are working to develop new ways of measuring impacts. The bottom line is that we get closer to zero waste by producing and using less, not recycling more. Here is a quick view of where we are in the planning process. Now that we've briefed you on the 2022 solid waste plan moving upstream to zero waste, we'd like to ask you to consider it for a possible vote at your next meeting on March 7th, followed by consideration of the full council on March 14th. Once the 2022 plan update is adopted by Seattle, we will submit it to Department of Ecology for final approval. We invite you to join us in championing waste prevention and moving Seattle upstream towards a zero waste future. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe earlier in the presentation, you mentioned that the State Department of Ecology has reviewed the draft plan and you've already incorporated uh, or addressed, I should say, their comments. Um, that's good news. Um, yes, Councilmember Morales. Thank you. Um, this is a very tangential question, um, but 
Uh, we have an issue in one of our business plazas um, where a property owner with lots of restaurants, lots of restaurants in this business plaza, uh, a property owner um, isn't providing sufficient waste uh, receptacles for these food related businesses. Um, and it's creating a lot of trash and rodents, as you might imagine. Um, so can you talk just a little bit about um, what the obligation of property owners are to provide uh, receptacles for their small businesses, for their tenants? Yeah, thank you. Um, it's a it's it's a little bit of a complicated question, not knowing which property exactly. But uh, in general, the commercial uh, customers work directly with our haulers. Um, they uh, contract with our two main haulers in the city for for garbage, um, and then they are able to go out more open market for recycling and composting. Uh, services. So they, that is their, those are their options they have uh, to do. We have a, a very, uh, uh, very good uh, inspection and compliance team uh, that works mostly with um, the residential customers, but also uh, works throughout the city, different parts of the city, uh, talking with uh, commercial customers about their waste, about their waste needs, whether they're right size, not right size. So uh, having said all that, we would be happy to look into that property specifically. That's really kind of what it takes to, to deal with the, the one-off issues is to, we yeah. have a team that will go out and work with them directly to make, make sure they have the, uh, the proper sizing and, and, and certainly encourage them to get the recycling and composting services that, that, that are, uh, that would be most advantageous. Yeah. yeah, and I think my team is already working with your team, so I appreciate that. It's just frustrating to hear, you know, our our, our business neighbors complaining about their inability to get their waste picked up when it's actually the property owner who isn't yeah. working and, to and get get the receptacles that they need. So yeah, and 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 we do have um, we do have some ability to do enforcement. Um, so we, but it's a you know it's a step. Uh, process sure. but we're certainly happy to look into that individual property and i appreciate it thank you start with helping them and then if we have to yeah. go down yeah thank you council morales i know that applies to a lot of our districts appreciate your asking that um council member herbal uh thank you another tangential question um as mentioned uh, at the top of the the briefing and i understand we may not have the uh the right folks here from SPU to address this question, but since we did have public comment, um, I did want to um, ask the question for the for the public record. Appreciate that uh, Committee Chair Peterson has um, has um, asked some questions um, separate from this meeting, but just wanted to put them on the on the public record here um, because of the, the public comment that we heard. Um, in this regards, the um, one, the contractual obligation of waste management uh, to, under our contract with them, to power their trucks with 100% renewable natural gas. Um, the fact that they um, advertise on their trucks um, that they're using uh, renewable natural gas and the, the um, claim that um, through analysis of uh, publicly available information that in fact the um, the trucks may be using um, conventional natural gas um, a completely different thing uh, conventional natural gas primarily comes from from fracking in Canada whereas uh, renewable natural gas is captured from uh, it's methane captured from landfill landfills sewage treatment plants and large dairies. So uh, two issues here. One is the advertising on the trucks, correct? And if not, um, waste management should should either paint over them or um, correct the um, the fuel source for the trucks and to um, the question of whether or not there is a compliance issue with the contracts. Thank you. Uh, thank you, council member. Yeah, we are, um aware of this information that's come out recently and we're um, we're looking into it uh, more deeply to make sure 
uh, we've got everything correct. We do have requirements in our contract uh, about using uh, natural gas and we do have compliance reports that are required from the contractors to be sent to us. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to misspeak. I don't know if, if anyone else on my team has any more updated information, but I know we are looking into that uh, as we speak. Really appreciate it. I don't have anything added, Jeff. So if you could get time. back to committee members with the um, answer after your research, we'd appreciate it. Absolutely. So that we can respond to our constituents and appreciate the public speakers for being here and raising this both uh, in online and via email. Absolutely. Okay. All right, colleagues, any more comments or questions? Um, again, central staff will be doing a, a, a memo for us analyzing this and you can get any questions that come up to Brian Goodnight on our city council central staff. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and go on to the next item. Thank you to Seattle Public Utilities. Next up, we'll hear from Seattle Department of Transportation. Um, we'll go ahead and have our committee clerk read the full title of the second agenda item into the record. Agenda item two, update on the Seattle Transportation Plan, phase two, for briefing and discussion. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, we last heard from the Seattle Department of Transportation back in September on updates from phase one of their crafting of the Seattle Transportation Plan. SDOT is back today to give us an update on phase two and what's next. Um, and colleagues, if you have any questions uh, about this matter, you can um, obviously reach out to Calvin Chow on our central staff. Uh, welcome, SDOT. Good morning. Um, my name is Francisco Stefan. I'm an SDOT Deputy Director for Capital Project Delivery, and I just wanted to kick us off this morning with a quick uh, thank you um, for inviting us to be here today. We are really glad that you're interested in this topic. We are really passionate about it and excited to share information with you today. Um, wanted to just uh, talk a little bit about how the Seattle Transportation Plan is our is really our long range transportation plan for the whole city. Uh, it's an exciting moment where we get to outline a vision uh, for the kind of equitable, sustainable, safe and inviting multimodal city that we aspire to be. And that vision for the future includes ideas, a, a, a wide range of, of policies, of programs, um, of different strategies, how we can achieve that vision for the future. Um, it's very much like the One Seattle Comprehensive Plan. It's a little different, but it's part of. It's sort of uh, both and. Um, it will be both SDOT's guiding vision for the future, as well as a component of the One Seattle Comprehensive Plan that is being prepared by OPCD. Um, I'm really happy to say staff is really proactively coordinating with uh, across the departments so that we have a vision for the future that synchronizes housing and land use, uh, as well as our outreach efforts and the environmental work that will go into adopting both of the documents. So I'm really happy to say that the coordination there has been great, um, as well as the outreach efforts have been coordinated. Uh, the Seattle Transportation Plan is one of SDOT's really big 2023 priorities. We are really excited about it. We as an agency are completely behind this effort. Um, and it is one of our top things that we're doing this year, along with the Vision Zero focus, the top to bottom review, and implementation of our very important transportation equity framework and the commitments of the mayor's executive order on reducing transportation greenhouse gas emissions. So, you know, it is one of our guiding lights along with those other uh, important parts of the work that we do. It is as well coordinated with, as much as it's coordinated with the One Seattle Comprehensive Plan, it's also coordinated with our funding package that we're developing. It's not the same, but it is the foundation of, the Seattle Transportation Plan is the foundation of the Seattle Transportation Plan funding package. It's very much like what we did as a city in uh, the mid aughts uh, with the Move Seattle document. The Move Seattle vision framed up the foundation for the Move Seattle levy. And we're doing very much the same thing here. So while today, while we're here to talk to you about some of our really great outreach 
on the Seattle Transportation Plan, we are also looking forward to bringing you in the future more information on the funding package effort as it is developed using the good information and the strong foundation here from the Seattle Transportation Plan. Um, and one want to hand it off to my, my uh, great staff in SDOT who are working on this project. Um, I want to give them just a minute of kudos to say that the outreach that they have been doing over the past, oh, better part of a year um, is some of the best I've ever seen. Uh, it is uh, going to people where they live. It is engaging with communities on their terms and in their languages. Um, it is compensating people for the important time that they give us to share with us their insights and knowledge. Um, and it is thoughtful and comprehensive. And I, I just wanted to give them kudos and say it really is fantastic work. I think it creates a strong foundation for both our transportation plan as well as our funding package. And I, I'm excited for what they're going to share with you today and what we'll share with you going forward into the future. So with that, I will pass it off to uh, Jonathan Lewis. Thanks, Francisca, and thank you, council members, for having us today. Um, appreciate your leadership, Francisca, along with Director Spots and their support for this effort. Um, so uh, an update on where we are today, um, on where the project is. We'll talk about uh, the timeline, a little overview of the plan. Again, you've seen a lot of this, but just for the folks following along at home. And then uh, dig into an update where I'll hand it off to my colleague, Lucy Mall. Um, she'll talk about what we're hearing and next steps. Um, so we're in phase two, as was mentioned previously. We could, we were uh, with you all uh, during phase one of the planning process, where we were uh, investigating the vision and goals and objectives for this uh, plan. This would be a 20-year plan, so we are. Uh, it's an opportunity, of course, to take a step back and think about the future of our streets and how those streets support the city as a whole. Um, in phase, so that was phase one, phase two, uh, digging into some of the details. There have been what we've called a menu of actions up on the, the website where folks could take a look at kind of the key strategic directions for the department over the next couple of decades. And then in phase, the second half of the second phase, phase 2B, we've been taking a look at our network maps, and doing a lot of the technical work that's behind the scenes um, where we've uh, lay, layering those network maps on top of each other and thinking about the some of the trade-offs in the right-of-way. All that's been undergirded with our um, engagement process uh, that you'll hear about from Lizzie. Coming up, we'll have a draft plan out in the mid-2023 period. So let's take a look at the next slide. Um, so so this plan has four key key objectives here. One is, um, again, to reimagine our transportation vision. Uh, this is uh, that chance to step back from the day-to-day -day grind uh, that we live in and uh, think long-term about how we achieve our goals for the streets and our city. Um, thinking about this uh, system from a people-first perspective and really grounding that work in our values. And then uh, meeting that moment of this planning process with some exciting and inclusive engagement. So on the next side, we'll take a look at why, why now? Why, why are we doing this plan now? So first is we've got some key uh, urgent challenges, the urgent and emerging challenges. Uh, we heard from a few folks about the Vision Zero top to bottom review that's presently underway. And that's definitely top of mind and one of the key challenges that we're considering in this planning process. Another is around climate action and the need to really move the needle further and harder on our emissions reductions. And then the other is coming out of the pandemic, we've really seen big changes in how people get around and how does our, our streets and our transportation needs, how have they changed, how will they continue to evolve and how do we respond and support folks in their trip making. Uh, the second one is around what Francisca mentioned around the, the connection between this work and our funding uh, in the future. And uh, working really closely with our, our funding team to make sure that uh, we're handing off a great plan that, that can undergird that work. The third is around our work with the comprehensive plan. 
we've been uh, really fortunate and excited to have these two plans uh, happening at the same time and um, doing some coordinated engagement that Lucy will mention, as well as um, there's big changes underway on the, on the comp plan side in terms of uh, housing, anti-displacement, um, and, uh, and where in our growth strategy and we're th working with them uh, closely to think about those things. Um, it's also a big update to the maritime and industrial areas. We've been working closely to think about freight and urban goods movement in the city um, alongside that work. Last I mentioned this, but on the technical side, we've been thinking about the trade-offs in the right-of-way. Uh, one of those is around a, a vehicle mile travel reduction target that council asked us to include in our comp plan uh, that cascades directly into this work. And uh, so thinking about how we, how we achieve that goal as well. On the next slide, uh, just to talk a little bit more about, uh, oh, <laughs> um, uh, about our values and how we're anchoring there. Um, so you can see the department's values up top, um, safety, equity, sustainability connect to some of the things I mentioned. On the livability side, we're really focusing on a people, streets, and public spaces dimension of this plan. That's kind of a new body of work that we're really excited about. Um, comes from a lot of folks uh, on the community side saying they really like the streets like Occidental and Bell, I'd like to see more of those types of spaces across the city um, as to help support their neighborhood, commercial areas and so forth. So excited about that work. Um, uh, that feeds straight into uh, our goals. I mentioned climate action and safety. Stewardship connects to our work around asset management um, and maintaining our streets and bridges and staircases. Um, and then equity, we've had a really strong uh, body of work to build on. Um, the transportation equity framework was released last summer after many years of effort. And, um, and we've identified about 80 of those strategies that we're able to help advance and cultivate in this work. I'll talk a little bit about the elements in, a, in the next slide, but just as a reminder here that um, uh, the kind of two big streams that kind of cascade down that, that diagram are the engagement and, the, and then the technical work. Um, okay, so now the slide about the comp plan. So um, the, uh, I mentioned that the comp plan team is really focused on housing and the growth strategy, and they're considering some changes to where we grow as a city and how we how we grow. Um, and then on top of that, they're uh, planning for a city uh, 20 years out that has almost a million residents. That's a pretty big jump in population, uh, also equally large employment growth as well. And that means lots of new trips and um, lots of new ways uh, lots of new kind of patterns that will be emerging. So we've been working very closely with them on the, the modeling side, on the engagement side, on our environmental reviews, and uh, also working to have a joint release of our, our planning documents and environmental documents this uh, in the coming months. So I uh, have that to look, uh, look forward to. Um, and then ultimately an implementation strategy that's, that's really supportive of of both efforts, both the housing and the transportation side. Um, all right, on to the elements. So, uh, kind of the key, like what will be in the plan, in the uh, uh, kind of nuts and bolts of of the plan. So, on the policy side, we're doing a lot of policy alignment and modernization. We have um, kind of the cornerstone of SDOT right now is what we call the four modal master plans. This one for walking, biking, transit, and freight all developed at different times. Um, mostly pointing the same direction, but a little bit of policy alignment there um, and uh, consolidation. Again, building on the, that transportation equity framework that I mentioned. Um, and then really just updating these things to reflect the, the current and urgent challenges that I mentioned. Feeds over into performance measures. Uh, you'll continue to see a vigorous focus on achieving vision zero, carbon reductions and creating a more equitable city, um, as well as our asset management and stewardship measures. The investment networks, um, in addition to uh, uh, priority networks for walking, biking, transit, and freight, 
we'll have a new network for people's streets and public spaces. Um, and again, doing the work. Excuse me, layering. Jonathan. For we've sure. got a comment or question from Councilmember Herbold. Okay, thanks. I, I think maybe Jonathan was about to get into the question that I had, which is really about um, how the um, maps for the modal uh, plans will um, be integrated in the STP. Um, will there still be separate maps for the separate modes or um, like how, how are that, this is a big concern um, that folks had when we were moving to this model um, and just want to understand a little bit more about how the modal plans are going to be reflected here. Um, and I hear you on one hand saying integrating so that to me that sounds like one big map, um, but on the other hand, um, you're talking about investment networks, so maybe in maps, both plural, so maybe they're going to mm -hmm. still be uh, dealt with separately, and the conflicts identified, I, just talk a little bit more about that, thanks. For sure, thank you for your question, council member. Um, it's uh, both and in terms of uh, what you'll see in the final, the final plans and in the draft documents coming out uh, in mid-2023. Uh, so we'll have some maps that show how things interact with each other and layer on top of each other. Um, and we will continue to have discrete priority networks for walking, biking, transit, freight, and then people streets and public spaces um, as key tools for how we uh, plan for and build out those discrete networks. Um, and then in addition, uh, layering them on top of each other and thinking about how complete corridors and complete streets are built out. So the final plan will include both. Um, so that's a really important, um, important point. Thank you. And just a follow up on that. Um, mm -hmm. Each of the uh, modal plans also had, um, you know, in, in addition to the, all the projects that uh, were, people were interested in having done over a certain number of years, there's the implementation plans for each of, each of the different modes. And, um, and so those implementation plans, I think, uh, talked about a sort of a, a cadence of impl implementation and prioritization and funding. And so how, how will that work for, for, the, for the different modal plans? Mm -hmm. uh, that's also a great question. Um, what we'll see in the, in the Seattle transportation plan will be a consolidated um, implementation chapter. Um, and then what we see, uh, in the annual implementation planning process across the department are those discrete programs, the bicycle program, the freight program, et cetera, and the pedestrian program, et cetera, developing a programmatic implementation plan. So I would expect um, that those types of programmatic needs will still continue to uh, occur. I think that the kind of key question is like, um, and council has a role in this, obviously, but how those programs are shaped in response to the plan or the funding package um, and what types of implementation planning is needed beyond the, uh, into the next uh, levy or future transportation and funding so would, package. Will there still be separate goals for each of the different modes as far as like, um, you know, historically there have been um, either uh, dollar amounts uh, that were the goals for each year, um, sometimes percentages, or I, I just don't want to um, sort of um, miss the trees for the forest um, if we're kind of putting everything under under one umbrella um, in the interest of, of equity. I think it's really important to recognize um, the separate uh, needs and progress um, that uh, is really critical to be made for each of these different different modes and have a way for us to hold ourselves accountable for either making that progress or not. Um, yes, Council Member, thank you. That's also a great question. I think we get a, a, I think a lot of this is going to be a lot clearer this summer when we when we share out a draft, but you'll see, uh, a kind of parent document where things are coming together. You'll see a lot of discussion about how everything works together from a walking, a biking, a transit perspective to meet community needs. We'll also see the eight elements of the plan and these build on and advance the work of the modal master plans that we've 
worked on and, and cherished for many years. And so there'll be eight of those, one for bicycle, transit, freight, walking, also one for vehicular, curbside, new and emerging mobility, and people, streets, and public spaces. So those eight kind of like sub plans or chapters will really focus on the needs of that element of the right of way, um, anchored, of course, to how we deliver complete streets and achieve our goals. And inside this, you'll see kind of a wedding cake of, of performance targets. At the very top, you'll see our cornerstone measures around such as Vision Zero and climate action. And then in each element will be some network related targets. So we are not losing that, the richness and integrity of those modal plants, but also thinking about how they uh, build on what we're hearing from the community uh, and, uh, and the technical side to achieve that bigger picture vision as well. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Um, last two things I'll note here are um, around the, the work that we'll be doing to hand this work off to our, our, our Seattle Transportation Plan funding package team, uh, thinking about project and program needs to, to deliver on the goals of the Seattle Transportation Plan along with uh, how we prioritize projects consistent with our values and then that funding strategy. So all of those things will be along the 20 year horizon and that, that funding package team will be looking more at the near term needs. Okay, with that, I will, I believe I'm gonna hand it off to Lizzie now to talk about uh, phase two of engagement, thanks. Thanks, Jonathan and Francisca, and thank you, council members. Uh, we are excited to share an update on engagement through the Seattle Transportation Plan. Uh, we've hosted an online engagement website and have been out in communities talking with folks over the past nine months. We've had more than 28,000 visits to the online uh, engagement hub with folks actively participating and providing a lot of feedback. Uh, we've had over 61,000 total data points collected so far. We've also been prioritizing going to where people are already gathered in community and Francisca touched on this a little bit. Uh, we've participated in 68 community events and 45 meetings and briefings, as well as additional pop-ups at grocery stores, farmers markets and other neighborhood locations. We attended a lot of festivals over the summer, including the Duwamish River Festival, Big Day of Play, Othello International Festival, Seafair and Dian Days Powwow, um, and had more intentional meetings and briefings over the winter months with specific organizations and community advocacy groups. Next slide, please. Uh, we also know that there are so many amazing community-based organizations that are serving communities all over Seattle. And we've had the opportunity to partner with seven organizations through this planning process, including the Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance, Central Area Collaborative, Duwamish Valley Sustainability Association, Estelita's Library, the Kamai Community of Seattle King County, Legacy of Equality, Leadership and Organizing, and Smash the Box. Um, I also wanted to note that four of these community-based organizations are also working with the One Seattle Comprehensive Plan Update. So we've really been able to have broader collaborative conversations about community visions for transportation, land use and housing all together. Next slide, please. Um, each of the community-based organizations created their own engagement plan and have been hosting events and working with their communities to inform us uh, about their community's transportation challenges and opportunities for the future. They've all been doing a ton of work on the Seattle Transportation Plan in addition to their usual community program. So we're super thankful to partner with them. Here are a few, just a few examples here. Uh, the Kamai Community of Seattle King County has been hosting events and field trips with Kamai elders and youth to explore more of Seattle's transportation systems. They've relayed to me that this work has been transformational for breaking down barriers between government and community who have not been engaged in processes like these before. The Duwamish Valley Sustainability Association has held workshops with youth advocates in South Park and developed a community walk for us to experience and reflect on transportation in the Duwamish Valley. Smash the Box has been active at community events and is using creative um, 
creative engagement and working with other community-based organizations to get the word out about the Seattle Transportation Plan. Uh, Estelita's library held events throughout the summer and created an impact report that includes thoughtful takeaways about transportation and land use. And this is really just a sample of some of the work these organiz organizations have been doing. We're really looking forward to featuring um, community reports and findings on our website this spring. Next slide, please. So right now we're nearing the end of our second phase of engagement, but here's what we've been asking folks to engage with online. Uh, we've had a set of interactive draft transportation maps for folks to comment on. Um, and we also wanted to check back in to see if our draft vision goals and objectives felt right after hearing a lot about what we want to achieve together during our first phase of engagement. We also asked um, about the future of transportation folks want to see, acknowledging that there are trade-offs with all of the futures presented to them. And then we also asked what actions we should take to achieve our goals. Many of these actions and ideas came directly from the first phase of engagement. Next slide, please. Um, so we put out a summary of the first phase of engagement in September um, and our summary of phase two will come out this spring. Uh, here are a few highlights. Um, in, uh, we got a lot of had a lot of conversation about increasing affordable transportation choices and options, um, asks to specifically invest in communities that have seen less affordable transportation options, but would highly benefit from increased choice in transportation. Um, safety is a major concern, as we also heard today during uh, public comment, and is a barrier to achieving an equitable transportation system. Uh, people want to see our transportation system rebalanced to provide more mobility options and uses of our streets. Maintenance is key to a good transportation system. Um, and people want more access to reliable transit and want to feel safe while they wait. And our BIPOC communities have specifically continued to highlight safety and access to affordable transportation systems. Uh, Jonathan shared where we've been, so what's next for us? Uh, we will be working on a draft transportation plan that we'll be sharing publicly in mid-2023. Um, we'll also continue to engage with folks through phase three, and they're looking forward to having more conversations about uh, prioritization through this next phase of engagement. Uh, we have an email address, a uh, multilingual phone line, and there's a link as well as a QR code to get to the engagement hub for the Seattle Transportation Plan. And next slide, just uh, another plug that we're partnering closely with the One Seattle Comprehensive Plan update. So feel free to check out their engagement website as well. Thank you, that's what we have. Thank you very much. I have a question. Oh, go ahead, Councilmember Morales. Thank. Uh, well, I've got several questions, uh, Chair Peterson. So I don't know how. how yeah, go we... ahead. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I first want to acknowledge uh, that there does seem to be kind of a shift in culture happening at the department, which I really appreciate. Um, um, you know, I, I was listening to Director Spots on the urbanist conversation that he had, and you know, he talked specifically about the kind of de-siloing of the departments that of the divisions that's happening right now. Um, you know, the concrete people are talking to the tree people now and making sure that there's a real understanding of how to be um, intentional about the work that's happening. So, um, so I appreciate that. Um, I will also say that the um, the uh, the slides still give me pause when we're talking about safety. Um, you know, one of the slides mentions. Um, let me see which one it is. Um, well, I don't have the numbers. What does the why does Seattle need this plan right now? And there's still a description of needing to balance quote unquote limited road space. Um, I think, you know, we have to remember that there's almost 4,000 miles of road in our city, which is about the distance between here and New York. 
So when we're talking about complete streets, when we're planning for safety, I, I think it's important to remember that also according to the department's data, we only have about 4% of that road space that's dedicated to on-street protected bike lanes or not even protected, just bike lanes, including sharrows. Um, so as we're, as we're having this conversation, and I, I agree that uh, with some of the commenters, I hope that we have a chance to do a really detailed overview uh, or review of the Vision Zero report when it's available. Um, I'm interested in uh, to what extent the department is really considering removing public storage space of private vehicles of private property in exchange for more public rights of way. Um, you know, looking at the SDOT uh, GIS data, um, the right of way, the sidewalk maps, there's large portions of our city, as you all know, um, where we have on street parking, but no sidewalks. So can you talk a little bit about um, the intentionality you're bringing to, to making some of that shift? Um, thank, thank you, council member. And the question is about um, the storage of vehicles in the right of way, is that, did I understand you correctly? Or off Well, street? I'm thinking, yeah, especially, you know, there are, there are folks who can't drive. There are right. folks who um, are effectively kind of subsidizing storage of cars on public land in a space where right. they themselves cannot access. And so I'm interested to know, you know, how we promote a more equitable access to our public road space. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, well, right right now, our current policy framework uh, does prioritize our uh, priority implementation of priority modes as our top priority for the right of way, and uh, long term storage of vehicles is our current lowest priority uh, in most street context types. Um, that policy's been around for about a decade, and it's been. Uh, very controversial to implement, as, as I'm sure you are aware. Um, I think we have worked to build on that policy framework to try to provide more clarity and more clear guidance, uh, both to uh, staff and decision makers around uh, the role that these uh, priority investment networks meet in terms of achieving our goals. Um, and uh, there are what, what's normally the case in a street is that we're we're weighing um, priority modes against priority modes when I think what we've heard very clearly from the community is that priority modes shouldn't be pitted against each other. We should really be deprioritizing storage or in some cases general purpose traffic movement. And so we have, um, uh, starting with council's directive to create a vehicle mile travel reduction target for the city. That's a new policy frame. Um, uh, that creates a new lens through which we can view some of these trade-offs and we're trying to provide some clear guidance for, for our teams and for, for everyone that, that helps uh, strengthen our implementation posture. Yeah, thank you. Um, can I ask another question, Chair? Please keep going. Um, maybe what would be helpful is if you could sort of explain what the department's definition of essential travel is. Um, and I, you know, I, I think of essential travel as being able to go to the grocery store, um, you know, being able to get to the doctor, get my kids getting to school safely. Um, and so I think understanding your last point, which is that, you know, different modes uh, don't need to be pitted against each other, different needs don't need to be pitted against each other. And I, I agree with that completely. And when we're talking about safety, when we're talking about people being able to navigate their neighborhoods, that is essential. Um, and it's just not clear how how that uh, phrasing is, is used. So maybe you could talk a little bit about what that means for the equitable allocation of, of the right of way. Um, okay, that's, that's a big, big, really big question. I think that in uh, maybe a, 
there, there's a couple different ways to view essential, and there is a, an emergency response definition that I don't think you're you're referring to, and that revolves around like after the Cascadia quake or after a major uh, declaration of our emergency, how would we, we would get around um, what would be essential. I think more from a day-to-day -day perspective, uh, there's a really clear focus and what we're hearing from the community is they want safe, affordable, um, and reliable travel options. And starting with uh, walking, biking, transit, um, and, and also acknowledging that there are certain trip types and certain times a day that really uh, driving is a, is a key thing that needs to happen. Um, someone gets uh, off work or needs to be at work at four o'clock in the morning, for example. So um, uh, someone going to a, a soccer game with a carload of kids is really a really difficult trip to do um, on transit. So um, we have worked to kind of balance uh, the, the different kind of trip profiles while and taking that into consideration while focusing our right of way allocation and our prioritization of the right of way on moving people and keeping people and creating safer streets. So that means uh, creating streets where cars are going slower um, and, and prioritizing our right of way allocation. As, as uh, someone mentioned early on, the right of way allocation today does not line up with our, our goals for travel. Um, you see way less. Um, way more towards the storage of cars uh, and way less for transit um, and people walking and biking. So uh, we are looking at that and, 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 and uh, trying to reprioritize how we, how we can move uh, into the next couple decades of effort here. Thank you, uh, yeah. Jonathan. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think that is part of the challenge, right? Is that it, whether it is policy or not right now, and I hope it's not, it does feel like we are prioritizing car parking over safe sidewalks and safe ways for folks to get around who can't be in a car. And so um, I'm glad to hear we're moving that direction and uh, look forward to working with the department to get us there as quickly as possible. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Colleagues, any other comments or questions at this time? Councilmember Strauss. Thank you, Councilmember. Thank you, Chair Peterson. Uh, Jonathan, Francesca, Lizzie, what a wonderful presentation. I really appreciate your time today. Um, this presentation in particular really demonstrates to me that we have about 15 corridors in Seattle that everyone wants to use and everyone needs to use these, these corridors. Uh, and the question comes to me is, how do we reconcile these different priorities? And then I know that you are starting to look at this. And I see the importance of this plan before us today, really uh, front and center is to identify the conflicts that we need to resolve. I don't necessarily see this plan resolving conflicts in each corridor and on each street. And I just wanna make sure that I'm understanding your presentation correctly. This, this overall Seattle Transportation ma Master Plan that combines all of these master plans into one isn't supposed to be the silver solution that solves for everything. Rather, it is giving us the map that is needed to identify where the pinch points and conflicts are for us to be able to better prioritize street space. Did I get that correct? I just want to double check. I think that's, uh, it's true. And there are some corridors where we think we're going to be able to make some adjustments in terms of what our priorities are so there's not as much of a fight downstream. Um, but uh, then we will also, to your point, lay out um, policy guidance and prioritization uh, in the plan that helps help uh, our implementation folks make decisions. So it's both. That, that's great. I appreciate that yeah. because, you know, I was in Interbay just this last weekend, which I believe is a transit road it's also a freight road it's the third most used north south corridor in our city between highway 99 and uh i5 fi interstate 5 and what really stood out to me was is that a street that is appropriate for bike lanes even though we need bike connections through there i'm going to answer my anecdotal question for you which is no i don't think that 15th avenue uh west is is a great place for bike lanes 
And it also means that the corridor that is between uh, uh, Myrtle Edwards Park and Fisherman's Terminal needs to be greatly improved. The bike infrastructure that was put in there was put in in the 1980s when we had a very different understanding of how to safely separate bicycle infrastructure, right? You know, I joked with someone this weekend, that's where I learned to ride my bike because it was a caged facility. But the reality, and the reality is, is that today that bike trail through Interbay is still a caged facility. And we know today that that's not an appropriate way to build bike trails. And so um, I just wanna thank you for the presentation and allowing me to share my reflections from this last weekend. I will, um, Jonathan, as you know, I passed a statement of legislative intent last year to look at our light rail network specifically beyond Sound Transit 3. Sound Transit 3 is already done, or the plan is already done. It's already baked. I can't get them to go to Crown Hill despite my best try, my best attempts. Um, I just wanna make sure that the, to check my assumptions, will the SLY request be included in these maps as far as what is our transit plan, spe specifically light rail planning beyond ST3? Uh, and if so, how will this specific aspect of outreach be accomplished? Um, thank you, Council Member. Yes, the, there are, we have two, uh, two provisos that we're working under for this plan um, and uh, absolutely considering uh, light rail or sound transit program expansions beyond ST3 as part of our work and, and that will be reflected in, in the transit, the, the transit element that I mentioned. Um, and we are uh, engaging with sound transit on uh, on that work as well. So thank you. Okay, I, thank you, Jonathan. I think that's important. And also I think that this is an opportunity since ST4 and beyond are not necessarily planned is to be able to say to Sound Transit, these are the needs that meet our community, right? Like we know that Crown Hill and reconnecting back to Northgate and beyond is a, is a great way for the Ballard extension. We also know that we need a lot more east-west connections. And also I know that we need to work with Metro to provide better east-west direct connections to light rail stations. So. I guess there's not a question in there for you, for you to respond. but I guess, you know, how, back to the question of how do you plan to do, are you planning to do broader outreach beyond Sound Transit or is Sound Transit kind of your main partner there? Um, uh, also, also a great question. We have been engaging with uh, and discussing uh, with folks that are interested in transit, uh, Transit Advisory Board, uh, Seattle Subway has given us some early input um, into that map, and then we'll be, um, when, once it's shared out with the public this summer, uh, as part of that draft plan, we'll also be excited to get additional input. Really well done. Thank you, John. Thank, Thank you, you Lizzie, Francesca. Thank you. Um, I've got one question, and I think a comment. So the, um, in terms of when you're engaging with the public, I, I really appreciate, um, in your slides where you summarize what you're hearing so far and the questions you're asking. Um, I, when you're asking people how they would prefer to get around, you know, and I hear a lot about wanting more affordable travel options. Um, my mind's going to transit in terms of moving the most people uh, in the most environmentally friendly way. Also, um, how are you accommodating then the the needs of freight to to move goods throughout the city obviously we've got we're a port city and the whole state relies on us to move goods uh we need to get food to the grocery stores etc so how how are we how are you all accommodating the needs of freight there also was a comment uh, a public comment about not just uh m my question is really about accommodating freight in this um as you're surveying the public but also how do you uh, make that more environmentally sustainable and safe? Um, thank you, Council Member. Um, uh, let's see, the, there's several different dimensions to our, our work related to freight and urban goods movement. I think that um, our freight master plan is one of our most recently prepared plans and is still 
very current and prescient in terms of its um, network. We do not see many many changes to that that planned freight network. We uh, there's a little bit of embroidery we're, we're doing. For example, the State Route 99 viaduct doesn't exist anymore. Um, but uh, beyond that, we are um, developing a pilot project to combine a freight and transit lane. And we're really excited uh, for that work um, and look forward to that result. those results. We are laying some groundwork in this plan um, where if that's successful, we could see additional freight and bus lanes around the city to help uh, maintain freight and goods reliability uh, and travel time reliability around town. Um, I think we don't get a lot of necessarily community input on the freight network, but we know that to support the city and to support um, about a quarter of our jobs in our industrial areas, um, quarter of the city's jobs are located in those industrial areas, we really need to uh, focus on freight and goods reliability and movement. The uh, last thing I'll add is that there's been a huge explosion of small package delivery, uh, which is a type of good movement that's largely um, uh, kind of outside the realm of the planned networks. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work thinking about that. Uh, we have a close partnership with the University of Washington's uh, Urban Freight Lab. And um, and they're helping us kind of hone in on the, the needs of the city over the next couple decades as we adapt to that, that uh, change in how, how uh, packages get around town. Uh, and a key piece of that is those critical access functions at the curb. We just are way, I think one of our earlier member, uh, uh, people that spoke talked about the kind of the goods movement, the alley overloading issues and, um, and see some opportunities to work with SDCI on um, updating our off-street loading opportunities and alley addressing alley congestion. So um, several key wedges there around how we're thinking about uh, the future of freight and goods movement. Thank you for your question. Thank you. And uh, lastly, you had mentioned uh, eventually this will lead toward a potential funding package. We know that the Move Seattle property tax is expiring next year. And, um, you know, we, we support uh, King County Metro through a, a sales tax, uh, the Seattle Transportation Benefit District. And unfortunately, that sales tax is regressive. I, I know uh, I hear a lot from constituents about property taxes. Um, we are going to property taxes to support other important issues in, in Seattle. So by the time we get to the Seattle uh, tr transportation plan funding, um, I, I think we'll want to try to diversify our funding sources and not just assume it's going to be the same uh, property tax uh, because by then people, um, our constituents will be feeling the, the ch a challenge of paying those property taxes. So uh, I know that we are, um, you know, cities around Washington State, uh, around the nation, they use um, impact fees to support uh, transportation and other priorities. So just um, wanted to make sure you're, you're all looking at a, a diversified uh, source of funding as you think about how to pay for all, all these great things we want to do. I can jump in. Yeah, we are uh, definitely looking at it's it at all the different possible sources. Um, obviously, we have relied on a levy in the past. It's not the only thing that we're looking at. We're looking at all the uh, the complete package of different funding strategies that SDOT might pursue, and that includes what you're talking about. Thank you, colleagues. I know we're we're eager to all run over to Seattle Center and and hear the mayor for his uh, State of the City address. Um, I really want to thank the Seattle Department of Transportation and all their partners for the work they're doing on the Seattle transportation plan. And we'll, we'll have you back in committee. We know you'll have a draft of the plan in a few months for us to, to go over and thank you for all your hard work on this. All right, colleagues uh, with that, um, it is uh, the time is 1106 and this concludes our February 21st, 2023 meeting of the transportation Seattle public utilities committee. 
the next committee meeting will be March 7th. Thank you very much. Bye.